Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's Rural Outreach and Innovation Talk, brought to you as part of the European Microfinance Platform. Over the coming weeks, we will be showcasing the latest trends in rural development by sharing ideas, experience, and inspirational stories. We are lucky today to be joined by Johanna Ryan, Vision Fund's Director of Social Performance, who will be presenting the Women Empowerment Fund, a new initiative that aims to impact 2 million women and 6 million children annually by 2021. Johanna has had a wide-ranging career that includes tutoring at Oxford University and 18 years in global banking operations. Joining Vision Fund in 2009, Johanna measured and assesses the product salaries, making sure efforts are tailored towards maximising the positive impact on communities and individuals. Johanna, thank you very much for being here today. Please begin whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, first of all, introduce myself by turning on my video for a second so you can see me. There we are. Um, I hope you can see me um, just for a minute. I'm actually in my daughter's bedroom, so please don't tell her if anybody comes across her. Uh, but we have builders in our house today. I work from home. And um, it might be a bit noisy, but um, so uh, forgive me if you hear some banging in the background. Okay. Um, let me uh, switch to sharing my screen with you and we'll get started. There we are. Uh, I trust that uh, you can see this, uh, this uh, wonderful picture of our clients. Now, um, what I would, but I'm having trouble moving the, one sec, there we go. Now, I'm talking to you today about the Women's Empowerment Fund which is a fundraising initiative that we have just launched within Vision Fund, specifically to focus on women. And the reason for that uh, is that about 1.1 billion women around the world lack access to financial services. And about 70% of people in poverty are estimated to be women. Moreover, you may have heard a statistic like this, that when women earn money, she spends up to 80% of um, her revenue, her spare revenue on her children compared to men spending um, about 30 cents. So for that reason, Vision Fund does concentrate on women because we're part of World Vision, which is the biggest child-centered charity in the world. So we want to help ultimately help children through our suite of microfinance services. And that means that we target women as our clients. So right now, uh, about 72% of our clients are women, and about 70% of them, of all our, our total clients, are in rural areas. And the reason we work in rural areas, as I'm sure those of you on this, this call will be familiar, is that, is that it's tough to do this in rural areas. A lot of microfinance institutions um, find it far too expensive and far too challenging logistically to work in rural areas. Uh, and yet, that is where the majority of poor people are to be found, and therefore, that's where we are. So when we're talking about rural and we're talking about women, inevitably, we, are, we have to consider women as farmers because they will be growing something if only um, traditional crops and vegetables for their own consumption, but they will also be selling whatever they have that is surplus. So it's very, very small scale. Yet, women are calculated to be 43% of the agricultural labor force, yet their control of the land is very, very minimal. Moreover, as women, they suffer additional constraints in such as the lack of access to credit because they're not perceived to have the ability to, to, to build a business, um, the lack of agency, that is, their, uh, their authority to make 
decisions about credit or other financial aspects of the household, and of course, excessive workloads. So these constraints don't just apply, of course, to agriculture, they apply to any endeavor that women are engaged in, in the in the countries where we work. So through the Women's Empowerment Fund, Vision Fund wants to break through these constraints. And we're doing that with six components of the fund. So I'm not going to go through every detail, don't worry. Um, so but the first component of the fund is we have to turn ourselves or become much more woman and child friendly. And we want to build we want to build long term relationships so that we can deal with these very complex and interwoven constraints over the long term because transformation doesn't happen with one small microloan one microloan transformation takes much takes much longer and we believe that to build long term relationships, we are best if we have female staff in the field, which itself is a challenge but we um we are doing this. We have developed a method for assessing and recruiting rural women with minimal um, numeracy and literacy skills, but sufficient to do the job. And um, I could talk about that for an hour, but I'll stop there. Um, I won't be tempted. Um, we will also make sure that our staff in the field, be they male or female, that they are are trained to recognize women and the context that women work in. Because very often it's just it's just not it's not intentional that women are not included, but it really is for lack of awareness of women's um, situation and the even the women themselves. We have of course to listen to the women and find out from our uh, our women clients, our target women groups, our target communities, what they actually want and what they need. That's very easy to say. It's quite difficult to do. Um, and we have started to use a, a tool that helps us to map our clients' journey. It's, you know, there are various industry tools to help us do this so that we can understand women's aspirations and understand where they are now and the challenges that exist for them to reach their aspirations. This, of course, means we have to have products and services that are appropriate to women's lives. Um, and you know, women, as we all know, in the rural areas where, we're, where we work, their primary responsibility is for the domestic care and for community care. So for the children, for the old people. And so when they are engaged in a livelihood, it has to be flexible to accommodate those primary responsibilities. Perhaps, you know, farming, as you can all imagine, with a baby strapped, strapped to the back. And women, of course, are not just asset poor, or not just time poor, they're always also asset poor. But the time poor measure, I don't know if anybody on the call has come across this estimate that if we add up all the hours that all the women in the world spend collecting water in one day, it adds up to 200 million hours. So, so just think about that for a moment. And how much more productive could women be if they weren't fetching water? So the Women's Empowerment Fund, I would like to reduce eventually that figure of 200 million, even by a small amount. And I'll come on to how we might do that in a minute. We are also um, very focused on producing insurance that's appropriate for women. So we need to look at the, the, the specific life cycle needs of women. And we also need to think through what clauses that are typically excluded for women, we can find a way to put back in so that we can cover for um, health issues related to maternity, so that, um, so that we can cover all the wives in a polygamous marriage, and also so that we can, when we are able, or when we have a, a, 
a product to cover children is that we won't exclude children who aren't registered. We won't force a registration certificate to be, to be produced. Training is going to be very important if we're talking about empowering women. A microloan, savings, insurance, all these are elements of empowerment, but empowerment itself is far more complicated. And this is where Vision Fund, as a microfinance specialist, will have to partner, and we look forward to partnering with experts in, the, in other fields, such as advocacy, um, such as including the men in the community in the conversation. So I want this fund, or I envisage this fund to be first and foremost about Vision Fund able to, able to deliver its services in a way that is specific for women. But we can't do everything, and I look forward to working with partners as well. Now, in terms of technology, um, we're all familiar with some of the barriers to women using mobile phone. But one of the things that I'm aware of is that in the future, uh, probably not very long in the future, everyone will have a phone, you know, all women will have a phone or certainly access to a phone. And increasingly, these will be smartphones. Yet, I know because I've seen it that women in India, for example, um, are, do not have smartphones because it is deemed inappropriate, especially for young women, to have access to uh, influences via social media or whatever it be that um, are so easy um, through a smartphone. So they are limited to, um, you know, like the old Nokia we all used to have. And the final part of this fund is that we will monitor and evaluate everything that, that we do. Currently, all of our social and financial data can be um, isolated for women, so we can, we can see how our, what our social impact is for women. But this is the empowerment fund. So I want to find a way of measuring empowerment that's simple, uh, that is efficient, uh, and do this with all of our women clients, um, not just through the, front, the fund, but, but everywhere where we work. And in the future, I would like to do some much more detailed um, uh, measurements and, and analysis about, about, about much more precise evaluation of the empowerment that is a result of, or that is, can be connected to our, our interventions, whether on our own or with partners. So that's a very brief um, overview of, of the, the Women's Empowerment Fund. Um, I hope that's enough to pique your interest uh, and to generate perhaps some, some questions. Um, and I will uh, perhaps just, while you're thinking of that, I will perhaps just um, uh, uh, conclude by, by saying that I have been, thank you very much, Matthew, for that wonderful introduction. And I have been with Vision Fund now for getting on eight years. I, I truly can't believe it. And I spend, I've, I spent quite a lot of time in operations before I moved over to heading up our social performance initiative. And I spend, I, I spend probably about a quarter of my time in the field, um, which is for me the most rewarding part of my, of my job. Um, meeting women, meeting clients. And the way I do this, by the way, is I, I, put a, I put a helmet on my head and I get on the back of a motorbike and I go out with the loan officers. And it is then that one actually can, you know, sit on the ground and you can have a conversation. And every time I do that, I learn something that helps me do my job better. And it's really tough getting out into the rural areas. I think that our loan officers and our field agents are the most important people in our organization. So the Women's Empowerment Fund, I am using as well to um, promote, maybe that's the right word, um, to promote and support our women staff in the field um, because very often, they can be doing the, 
lowest level of jobs but are not necessarily rising up the organizations and I don't think I'm giving away any secrets here and so by going out into the field I, I support not and learn not only about our clients but I find ways as well I hope to improve the conditions that our loan officers work in and to support our female staff to feel empowered themselves um, in their lives so it's a little bit about me that I wanted to end up on while I give you um, time to think about any questions you may you may have. Well, thank you very much, Ohana, for a very insightful presentation, uh, raising many interesting points, I believe. And I do have a feeling that the audience will have quite a few questions for you. Um, but before I open up the floor to the discussion, I thought I'd come in with the first question. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us more, a bit more about how uh, funds are actually dispersed under the Women Empowerment Fund. Um, is it given to individuals or to groups and organisations or some combination? Ah, thank you. That's a very good question. So um, we are an owner operator of our 30 microfinance institutions around the world, and we oversee the funding of those 30 institutions um, and so the funds would be distributed uh, where the first of all a donor might specify a country which is fine um, otherwise we will allocate the funds according to the obviously the financial need of the institution but also equally important that institution's willingness and ability to meet the objectives of the fund and the, this money then goes to the um, MFI in country and is distributed whether to individuals or to groups, um, that is client groups, is, uh, is part of their usual credit analysis and credit decision. Does that, does that answer your question, Matthew? It does, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so quite a wide remit then. Um, and are you expecting uh, some of the funds to be used in like, setting up new businesses or in establishing uh, other services to end user clients? Uh, sorry, I missed that second part. Uh, uh, so are you expecting um, some of the funds to be used in, say, like, would a client be used in the fund to set up a new business? Would that be a common use? Um, or are you more expecting the funds to be used in establishing new services for clients? Uh, so we would expect the funds to be used um, to support small livelihood endeavors. Um, so if we lend to a group, for example, that might be, it, it might start out as a self-help group or a savings group. Um, in fact, I'm glad I'm mentioning savings. Is that one of the best ways to bring some kind of financial empowerment to women is to set up savings groups where they meet together regularly and serve, save minute amounts of money in a communal pot that then they can lend out to one another, charging interest. And by the way, the interest that they charge can be quite high. The interest paid by the borrower goes back into the pot and then at the end of the year is distributed as um, dividends to all the members. It's a, I'm sure that there are people on this call who are familiar with uh, this savings group methodology. So the next phase of graduation might be for Vision Fund to lend to that group. And we just lend, if you like, to the savings box, and the group itself then has more liquidity to lend out to the their members. And when we do that, we would find, we do find that a subset of that group might want to set up their own group and become direct clients of the Vision Fund because they want, for example, to start an additional trading business. So it's not just for fixing up their house. They want to start an additional trading, trading business or they have the opportunity to buy high quality seeds, they want to buy fertilizer, whatever. So it very much is, can be a graduation process, but in other instances, Matthew, we might lend money to somebody who's got, let's say, an established 
tailoring business and they have a vision of being able to expand this to employ others and they've identified a niche in the market and they think that they can they can develop this into a, an endeavor that would employ other people uh, wonderful thank you very much um does anyone else have any questions for you Hannah? Please uh, don't forget to unmute your microphone as well. Uh, Joanna, is Michael Gottenbusch speaking? Hello? Uh, he's Michael Gottenbusch speaking. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, so I have a question uh, about uh, uh, a showcase. Um, I understand that Vision Fund is doing this already and you want to expand uh, the activity of, uh, of supporting women, right? Correct. So, yeah, so... Um, uh, what would, in which place basically um, uh, can you report uh, a showcase? Uh, and what were basically, uh, in your uh, view, the key success factors anyone who wants to, um, uh, to work with women should take in account, really, um, uh, to make it work? If this can be generalized at all, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let me take the first, let me try and remember all this. So, first of all, um, we. Uh, I, I was actually just analyzing where yesterday, um, because we do do all of this already. The difference that we're making with the Women's Empowerment Fund is we're doing what we already do, but we're, 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 we're going to do it better for women. So none of this is revolutionary. It's, if you like, transformational for Vision Fund to focus much more on women. So in Asia, I, um, off the top of my head, more than 90% of our clients are women. So we already know an awful lot about how to work with women. But if I'm honest, I think in some cases, it's, it's the women who have sufficient flexibility to come to the, the microfinance institution, but the money that they're borrowing is going to um, a family endeavor. It's not specifically the woman's endeavor. So in those cases, we need to get a bit, we need to get more intentional and more analytical about what women need. So we've got the numbers, we've got more than 90% women, but how do we actually adjust our service, have more agency, have more authority, have more independence, if indeed that's what they want. We're not forcing this on anybody. So um, where I'll, I'll give you an example of um, uh, in a different continent, this is in Senegal, where I was there uh, earlier this year, beg your pardon, last year, to implement this technique, this toolkit for recruiting rural women as our loan officers. And one of my colleagues, a branch manager called Fatu, who uh, managed a rural branch, was so fired up by this idea of really focusing on women that she made a, a definite effort to hire women as her loan officers. So now amongst her seven loan officers in her branch, five of them are women. She also made a concerted effort to reach out to women um, as the institution you know, didn't, well, didn't really do. I think they have, I think our MFI in Senegal has between, between 50 and 70, I can't be precise, percent women clients. Fatu, in her branch, reaching out directly, she now has 91% female clients. So, so it's, it, some of it's about attitude, but now, you know, Thanks for, for Fatu doing this, but now let's give Fatu the tools to be able to deliver products that are more precisely what her female clients um, need. So um, that's the first part of your question. What was the second part? I'm sorry. Thank you, Joanna. The second part was success factors, basically. I mean, uh, key success factors anyone should take into account when. Uh, when doing such projects, uh, very very important. So I um, I, I've, I did flash up um, uh, a slide about the monitoring and evaluation that we do. So percent of women, you know, doesn't mean really very much in this context. We also use the 
Progress Out of Poverty Index, which really is just a measure of economic poverty. It doesn't measure any other kind of poverty. So that's why I want to put in these questions about empowerment. Um, there are going to be simple questions that our loan officers, whose jobs are already really difficult, um, can find easy to ask their clients. And we can track the responses to those questions over time. So, but the success factor really is about the woman's self-perception of her ability to achieve her dreams, to be part of the decision-making in the family, in the community, to be seen to be a, a, a contributor in the community, not necessarily a leader, but wouldn't that be wonderful? And in order to evaluate these things, it does take um, quite specific and targeted and deep dive analysis. So we intend to do that by engaging um, special researchers to help us with that. Um, we can't do it ourselves. And this, the, the success factors would be, uh, being a little bit generalized, would be have, have the women have the women been able to articulate their ambitions and B, then achieve their ambitions? And have they not suffered in the course of so doing? Um, and without going down a rabbit hole on this or without getting too narrow about this, but one of the unintended consequences of women's empowerment can potentially be um, an increase in conflict in the household or the community. So we have to be very careful of those unintended consequences as well. Okay, thank you very much, Johanna. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Michael and Johanna. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I actually have a question, if you, you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much, Johanna, for, for the presentation and for the answers. Um, so you were speaking about unintended consequences, um, and then earlier in the, the presentation, you spoke also about including men in the conversation. Um, it, I mean, is that kind of what you meant in trying to avoid some of those unintended consequences? And could you speak a little bit more about um, like how you're trying to involve them in the conversation to help uh, better empower women and maybe overcome some reluctance on the part of women? I'm assuming that's what you meant. That's exactly what I meant, yes. Um, and um, so the, there are there exist um, there exist some training training programs education programs maybe is a better term that include men in the conversation. So with the intended consequence of getting the whole community to understand that empowering a women doesn't mean disempowering the men. And there are different ways of doing this. You can do small ways do this, and you know, with a quite concerted um, education program. One of the one of the ways I'd like to us to, to try, and we are um, we're going to be trying this um, in Senegal, in fact, is to get women get some kind of woman's champion, if I use that expression from the community who is a man, and probably a younger man, um, to actually to help to um, generate positive um, attitude to developing women's livelihoods. And part of the part that's really, really difficult, well, there are many parts that are difficult, but one practical issue is that by empowering women to develop their livelihood and reach, you know, their reach some kind of aspiration, we may actually be adding to their work. We will be adding to their work. We will not be diminishing it. So the woman is developing her, 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 let's say, her tailoring business, but she's still looking after the children, the old people, and doing all the cooking and the fetching of the water. By engaging men in um, in ways that are appropriate to the context, we would want to see shift in the distribution of, of workload. And indeed, on, and another way of doing this, by the way, um, is 
that we're talking to a partner potentially in India who, who has already set up childcare facilities, um, which are very unusual in the communities where we work. Um, but if we could try a pilot, the setting up a childcare facility, thus lessening the burden of domestic work, um, allowing the woman to develop her life, but to set up that childcare facility, that's a huge cultural change. And so we'd have to work very carefully with the men, with the community leaders, to make sure that we are not, that we are doing this in an appropriate, in an appropriate way. Gotcha. Um, do you ever find, um, when you go into communities, do you ever find a reluctance on the part of women um, who might have a desire but are afraid of um, going for it because of maybe, um, you know, it's a, typically a patriarchal society or they're afraid of any consequences? And do you do similar programs before you, I guess, start the, um, the more financial aspects of it and the other empowerment aspects? Well, I'll be in, I'll be honest with you. That's what we need to get much better at. Is that yes, without a doubt, we we meet women who don't well, they don't want to continue, or they don't see, have a, they don't see how they can possibly have the challenges to reach their livelihood objectives. But even before that, if they if they don't have faith in themselves, they don't have have um, confidence that they can. They can develop a lot of it. They won't even come to the meeting. So that's what I mean when I when I say that we have to become much more aware of where, where we go to talk to women. If we go to the marketplace when it's the day for trading cattle, you're not going to meet the women. But if you go to the marketplace when um, – you know the, the 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 food is being sold then you will meet the women so it's becoming much more thoughtful about how we approach women in the first place and and learn to ask the right questions um and we do ask the right questions but i think it's really getting finding the women in the first place Interesting. Do you ever find it um, necessary to develop uh, like country or, or maybe even region specific strategies then to, to go out and do that and start that conversation with them? Oh, yes. Um, certainly. Um, what works, it, not even in the country, but actually in different regions within the country. Um, mm -hmm. And we, this is where our local staff are so important. I cannot... I cannot develop a global, a, a global solution. I, it's something that we do. We have to engage local staff. Moreover, engage local local women, our local female staff. Um, and then again, we've got, and I kind of I kind of hinted at this earlier. There again, we've we've got the same challenge: is that just as just as underconfident potential clients won't come to the meetings, won't come forward, won't express their views. So too with our female staff who have never been listened to, we need to make an effort to listen to them and say, you come from these communities, help us. What is going to work in your community? And, and it's wonderful when we ask these questions because with a little bit of encouragement, you do, uh, I do hear really, really good ideas that are worth trying. They, they might work, they might not work, but let's try it out. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, it's a, definitely an interesting topic, but uh, I, I don't want to monopolize all your time. I think I've asked my question, so I want to give some time to other people if they have them. Thank you very much, Brian and Johanna. Does everyone else have a question at this point? We still have time for maybe one more. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Okay. So um, my name is Intan, and I just want to share some experience that we are facing here related to the woman empowerment. I'm I'm all ears, please. Ah. Okay. 
So, um, the main objective of this program is that the woman will be empowered. So, that will be our main objective for everyone. And uh, based on our experience, we need to always consider the local values. For example, in Aceh, in, um, in my location, uh, before tsunami, the women were afraid to work outside the house and they even afraid to study. But now, women are more brave but still, you know, uh, living in a location that previously hit by the huge disaster is not easy because the mindset of the people, they are too, uh, previously after the tsunami, the donors come and deliver money for free and giving like uh, the tools for the household and clothes and everywhere and everything for free. So every time we talk about funds that in, in terms of loan, um, for some people it's a little bit difficult, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know. So my suggestion um, is, so for the Women Empowerment Program, uh, maybe let's not start with the fund first, but start with the empower first. So maybe we can start with the skill development training for the women, and then we help them to build the self-help group, and then we build the group lending, and then we can start the fund. Yeah. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. You know, that's, that's, a, um, um, that's a really wonderful thing to have added. and. Um, I can share um, I can share that challenge as well. So, as I said, we are part of the World Vision Partnership, and World Vision, as as I'm sure you know, um, they yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, they worked a lot in in Aceh. Um, they uh, they do a lot of this initial development work, and what we and we will certainly do partner with World Vision all over the place. Who so we work in the areas. That's how we started. Actually, was working alongside World Vision when they found that you know a community or an individual or a group had actually reached a stage of being able to economically um, uh, grow and develop. Then the then we Vision Fund the microfinance was introduced. So you're absolutely right that this you have to start with a belief and then move on from and a belief and a self-confidence and the basic building blocks and then build on that. You're absolutely right. So, uh, so we work with World Vision as a partner and I would certainly work with other partners if they wanted to who are doing that early, that, those fundamental building blocks of yeah. um, empowerment and, uh, and, and reducing vulnerability so that the microfinance mm -hmm. does no harm. I absolutely agree with you. And one of the things, by the way, you might be interested is that um, Vision Fund, being part of World Vision, and you can see on this logo, you know, we, we're both orange, we, yeah. the, 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 we look the same, is that we might have, uh, we might have a client, a first-time client who comes from World Vision and they're accustomed to receiving things for free, you know, inputs or asset transfers, whatever. And then they come to us and they say, well, now you have to pay back the loan. And it, it, that education is very important and we spend a lot of time making sure that we, are, that we are lending to people who understand what it is to go into a formal credit contract because that's what it is. Um, we don't take, for the majority, vast majority of our microloans, we do not have any collateral at all. It is merely the social cohesion that we rely upon and the cross guarantees that are part of the group arrangement. But interestingly, um, but interestingly, World Vision is now moving away from asset transfers because of the because of the long term expectation that could be that could that could be built into the the community um that there'll always be somebody there you know to to hand out and I don't mean that in a patronizing way I just mean that if there's always somebody there to to give something then you know it 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 it's hard to switch to a more commercial relationship with um w with an entity.
So yes, I agree with everything you say. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to, to everyone. I'm, I'm afraid it is all we have time for today. Uh, but again, thank you to everyone for participating and especially to Hannah for her wonderful presentation and answering all questions so digitally. That was a very enjoyable discussion and raised as many uh, interesting challenges and opportunities for the future. Uh, the Rural Outreach and Innovation Talks will continue on September 19th when Dr. Bridget Gailman will speak to us about her experience of using digital communication to improve cooperation with project partners. I look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you again for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.